You mentioned the th- uh, Fred and Joe, the F and J construction uh, twenty nine. I mean, that was one of the big rides of your career. Obviously, and I know they were great to you, and and uh, you had a lot of success with them. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, I drove for Barry uh, for two years. And Barry, you know, they raced, you know, centrally located in Oklahoma, but he was never going to take me anywhere um, as far as on the road or any of those things. And then I quit Barry to drive for Bobby Sparks, and me and Bobby had a lot of success. You know, I'd never been to Memphis, Tennessee for a race. Short track nationals. You Little Rock, you know, yeah. I'd never been to a lot of these places. So he, you know, Bobby Sparks, I mean, we talked about um, – people that helped you. Barry helped me because he gave me a ride and was really good. I mean, I, I'm still friends with every car owner I've ever drove for. I could pick up the phone tomorrow and, or right now and call them and, and uh, you know, we've, I've always never burned a bridge. Right. And uh, Bobby Sparks had this 23-year-old race car driver that he really thought he was somebody that really didn't know what he was doing, but he was willing, he wanted to be a race car driver. And uh, Bobby Sparks had something over me that I I just, I still to this day don't understand it. it it's a Carl Kinzer, Mark Kinzer, Carl Kinzer, Steve Kinzer deal, because there was one time at Little Rock, Eric Sandage was leading the feature and I was running second, and I wasn't catching him. And the caution come out, or red come out, Bobby come up on the track, and I said, man, if you would just make this thing have some grip leaving the corner here, I said, I'd drive right by and we'll win this race. He said, no problem. He went back and did something. They throwed the green. We drove by. Eric won the race by like a half a lap. Race was over. I pulled in, and, you know, because I'm pretty mechanical. What would you do, Bobby? I want to know what you did. He said, I didn't do anything. He said, you just thought I did, and you won the race. <laughs> so... There was a lot of those, you know, and then after he told me, I wish he would have never told me that because there was a lot of times then, you know, after that, Bobby, we need this, that, and the other. And I, did he really do it? Did he do it or, or not? not? You yeah. know what I mean? So, <laughs> but Bobby, Bobby taught me a lot as far as what a crew chief and a mechanic can do together. And, you know, Steve and Sammy, you know, you look at um, shots and Ricky Warner, you know, what they've accomplished. Look at Brown and Chad, you know. Now they've been together a few years and they've they've accomplished a lot together. And I really not, I haven't had that in a long time. And, you know, my nephews went back to work for me. Back in the, the F&J construction days, you know, Bud was the crew chief. Right. And, uh, you know, they, we won a lot of races because we could communicate and, you know, I'd re- just like on a yellow flag looking, you know, in the last, three years prior to him coming back to work for me, I didn't have that person that I could count on to, mm-hmm. on the yellow flag, look at and, and say, hey, what am I doing wrong, doing it? And uh, now with him around, you know, it's it's taken a little time for us to get back going, but it's uh, it's starting to get there. Yeah, I was, I was gonna mention a lot of your career, you just done it on your own and, and uh, sometimes you can dial yourself out just as well as in and then the mental thing starts in and, and the mental downs, it's tough to tough to bounce back and get your confidence back. Yeah, you know, the biggest thing is I think, you know, uh, Todd Carlisle and his family have have gave me a great opportunity with this race team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's been some times, you know, in the last two or three years that I've thought about, you know, hanging my helmet up and doing something different. But what it what what really what it boiled down to is is I just, you know, I was doing everything. You drive the truck, you go to the car wash, you do everything and I was just getting burnt out. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I can't do everything. So that's why we, we got the boys, you know, Bud and Slip there. And, and like today, you know, they're over there working. And if this would have been three years ago, I couldn't be sitting here with you. I'd have to be over there working. And it's taken a load off me. And it's make it enjoyable again for me to want to race. Uh, it was always fun. But, man, it just got to be, I'm getting older. It's a grind you know, in between. I'm getting yeah. older. And, you know, my girls and, you know, I, I need to do things with those guys. And. I'm learning, you know what I mean? I've yeah. I've always been nothing but race car driver for the last 30 years, 25 years. And, you know, lots of lots of things put on the back burner, but now th- there's some stuff out there that's that's starting to get taken care of that I didn't really care about before. Yeah. I think we're going to write a book on you someday, probably. 
That'd be well. There had to uh, be three versions. <laughs> <laughs> the very, what versions of those? Be? Well, the the story, the good stories that I got that you know from lots of can't happen on camera. And and you can write about them, but then it'd have to just have a you'd have to put some a warning. Yeah, or something. Mm -hmm. for sure. You know, racing. Yeah. For sure. You know, I grew up with I grew up with Ronald Laney. Yeah, racing. So <laughs> that'll tell you a lot there. And then. Just lots of, lot, you know, there's lots of crazy guys up and down these roads. You know that. Yeah. Um, why don't you tell us the, uh, you got a lot of stories. Why don't you tell us the, the story where you got some splinters up in Minnesota? I mean, about that. <laughs> I think it was actually about uh, 07. Is that when we went to Brainerd with ASCS? Yeah, 2007. I think it was. Yeah. But uh, sitting up in the stands watching heat race or hot, I don't remember what race it was, but some people come up wanting to sit down. They said, would you guys slide down? So I just slid across the bleacher. Man, was that a mistake. <laughs> I got the biggest splinter in the, my rear end, and I mean, it was bad. And I had to go back and get it, I mean, like bare butt right in the trailer with tweezers and anything you could do to get this thing out. It was surgery right in the trailer. That's but where the crew chief really comes in, Andy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it... Uh, I don't remember who did it or whatever, but it was it wasn't pleasant. They remember. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they do, but it wasn't pleasant. It definitely wasn't pleasant. But it uh I we won the race, actually, I think we did win the race there at uh Yeah. So maybe I ought to get more splinters. <laughs> Could be it. It's probably maybe I got you get, up in the seat a little bit. Yeah, it was <laughs> probably want to get out of that seat. That thing was hurting. <laughs> so uh I also want to talk about um not so funny. Uh, you had that bad crash at Elma, Washington. Uh, you almost lost your foot in the deal. And if it wasn't for one or two of the EMT guys there, uh, you you might have lost your lost your foot. Yeah, you know it. Uh, it was a really tough time in my life. That you know, um, it's still it's still emotional because you know what I didn't I didn't know that I was going to have a foot when I woke up. You know, I remember them wheeling me down to the ER and. And I was strapped to that gurney, and why don't we talk about it? I mean, there was a crash, and then they got to airlift you out. Of, um, what did they do right after that accident? Well, what happened was there was a midget crash right before the sprint car feature, and they hauled this guy out. Well, they started the feature, and nobody knew that the ambulance that they pulled back in, there was you know one ambulance left, new ambulance came in. Well, when I crashed, the ambulance didn't even have a paper towel in it. It was actually just a shell that they had parked over there. They just wanted to get the race over with, I guess. I'm not really sure. You'd think there would be a little bit of liability there, but anyway, uh, I crash, and, uh, you know, it was pretty messy. Uh, they hauled me out of there, put me in this ambulance, but they wouldn't leave the track. And they said, we can't leave the track because, excuse me, this track or this ambulance is not roadworthy. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, why is it here? You know, and I'm in pretty, pretty, I mean, I'm in some pretty good pain. And uh, finally, I just told him, I said, listen, if you do not take me, I'm going to have, I'm going to get in a car with somebody else because I feel like I'm, I mean, I started getting lightheaded and mm -hmm. thought I was bleeding to death. I really oh, did. Blood. I really thought I was bleeding to death. And uh, Jerry, and, I, and I'm, I'm just drawing a blank right now, his last name, but uh, he was an, he was actually a fireman. And he was in there, and uh, he just took his hands, bare hands, on my ankle and my foot and put them back together and just held them together as tight as he could. And he finally just told the ambulance driver, said, go. And they were radioing to the hospital, and the hospital's like the closest one. I think it was McCur uh, McCur 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 what is it? McNary. McNary. And it's like seven miles away, and they're radioing that they were on their way, and they're saying, "Don't bring him here! Don't bring him here! There's nothing we can do for him." And the next one was, you know, a half hour. Well, I'm not kidding you. I thought I was bleeding to death, and maybe I wasn't, but I really thought I was. I thought I was dying. And uh, the EMT told, told, or the fire guys, or the fireman just said, "Go. We're going there no matter what. Even if they don't, at least we can get him stable there." Well, we went there. Uh, they got me stable. They brought a helicopter in and it was so weird. It was such a small airport or a small hospital. They had to put me back in that ambulance and wheel me down to the <laughs> high school football field and put me in the, in the, air, in the helicopter to, to send me to, to uh, Seattle. Anyway, long story short, uh, got, had, had surgery, you know, was fortunate enough they could put it back on. 
and it survived. Uh, and all I could think about was that guy, you know, that, and I might, I might tear up over this because I'm telling you, it was pretty traumatizing. But they call me Oprah. The guy, the guy, uh, Jerry, uh, and man, I wish I could remember his last name right now. But anyway, that's all I could think about. You know, he's like, without him, I really thought, you know, I was going to die. And so <clears throat> anyway, I got through the surgeries and I landed at home, finally got to go home like three weeks later, two weeks later, whatever it was. And I, this guy was in my mind, and I was like, man, I've got to figure out who this guy was. So I got on the phone, I started making phone calls, and I called, and I finally got a hold of this guy. And he goes, I said, you know, I'm not a rich guy. I said, but if there's anything you ever need, I said, you know, I'm here for you. If you need something, you call me. And I said, financially, emotionally, mental, just call me. If you need me, I'm here, because you know you were there for me. And he said, and this is what's crazy to me, he called, he said, you know what? He said, I'm really glad you called. He said, would you call my boss? And I said, I'll call anybody you need me to call. He goes, I'm getting fired over this deal. They were firing him because he didn't follow, follow the pro protocol, protocol yeah. and did what was right, you know. And uh, so I called, and he ended up, he didn't lose his job. I called and, and talked to his boss and the city counselor or whoever it was there in Alma. You know, I'd, I made a lot of phone calls on his behalf. And every time that I go to Alma now, I look him up and just go over and say hello, shake his hand. And it's, uh, and I actually, I didn't see him this year. I asked for him and they said he was, I don't remember what they said, he was doing something different, but I didn't see him this year. So, but without, uh, without him, it was, uh, you know, who knows? I probably, it was like a scratch or something, but I thought <laughs> I was dying. <laughs> no, it wasn't a scratch. How long were you in the hospital up there then in Seattle? I was in the hospital for, I think eight days. And I had to stay in the area for two weeks, so yeah. because I had to go back for some checkup. Like I said, they didn't know if it was going to take. I mean, it was it was pretty pretty mangled, and like I say, it wasn't completely amputated. There was one inch of skin and the Achilles tendon that wasn't severed. The rest of it was completely severed, and and the main artery was not because it was right with the but. Uh, people tell me all the time now that you know when they got me out of the car and I got on the backboard and when they peeled the backboard over the back of the cage and I remember it because it hurt like a son of a gun but my right foot fell off the <laughs> fell off the side of the board and there's all these people at the fence watching you know and uh, but fortunately you know I, I went to a good hospital you know Harborview is is one of the top three trauma hospitals in the country and uh, the surgeon actually told me the next day that if it would have happened in Lincoln, Nebraska, or some small town like that, they would have just amputated it because it would have been easier. Yeah. So, because they worked on me for 14 hours or something to reattach everything and put it all back together. As I recall, you kind of had a schedule in your rehab, though. Uh, you are walking before you are supposed to, and... Most of that because of your stubborn brain, but yes, silly. You know, I had open wounds for nine months, and uh, I wasn't supposed to put any weight on it for four months. And <laughs> I transferred to a doctor in Des Moines, and I didn't like the guy right off the bat because he told me everything I couldn't do. You know, and I was like, I want to do this, I want to do this, and that, and, and he wouldn't let me do anything. Well, about sixty days in. Uh, I started testing the waters at home with a, with just kind of putting some weight on it, seeing how it felt, because I felt good. And I wasn't taking pain medicine or anything, so I was like, man, it feels pretty good. And I was able to move my toes and move my ankle somewhat. And uh, I went in to the doctor and he said, no, you can't do that. And I said, well, I'm tired of these crutches. He said, well, how about I give you a boot and a cane? I'm like, well, that'll work. So he gave me a boot. I never used a cane. I went home, wore the boot for about, I don't know, I wore the boot a while, but the next, well, it was a week. It was one week because I had to check up every week. And I went in the next week and I just carried the boot with me and I walked in there and he was in shock. He's like, you're gonna tear that all up. And I said, well, I said, it may be, but I said, I feel like I can do it. And you know, it was one of those deals. 
uh, it's not a normal job. I don't have workman's comp insurance. I want to get you back own your in, own team. I wanted to get back yeah. in the race car and see what I could do, and uh, I, I begged him to get me rehab, and he got me into some rehab and right here in Knoxville, and and uh, uh, Anthony was the the guy that I worked with, and he whooped my butt daily, and. He was a blessing because he worked my, he, the rehab was in the gym and I always scheduled at four o'clock because I'd do an hour rehab and at five o'clock he was over, he was done. Well, he was a big muscular uh, weight lifter guy and he's like, if you want at five o'clock when we're done, if you want to work out with me, we'll work out. And it's perfect, I needed to get back in shape. So we went to the gym and he kicked my butt so much that that really and truly, he, he whipped me into shape. And, and uh, I'll never forget that it was about, what happened in July, the last race at Devil's Bowl is normally late September. End of October. Oc yeah. in, oh, is it the end of October? In the middle of October. Yeah. Well, anyway, we, so whatever time frame that is, I said, I'm running Devil's Bowl. I'm racing Devil's Bowl, I don't care. I'm doing it, because I want. I want to run Devil's Bowl that way leading into next year I know what I need to work on so we put a car together and man it was we end up running a fifth or something and uh, RJ Johnson actually went with me to help me because I didn't have any help and he, he still tells a funny story that as I couldn't move my ankle I mean I could but I couldn't really throttle what I was doing I have no idea but I just wanted to race to see what I, I was in pretty good shape yeah. physically I just couldn't I didn't have the flexibility yet and I said, I'm doing it, we're racing. So we went down there, and I'm not kidding you, I had to pick my f whole leg up to give it the gas. Because I couldn't, well about halfway, excuse me, halfway through the race, I couldn't, my leg got tired. I got tired of moving my whole leg up down to give it the gas. Finally I said, forget it. I just let her lay on the wide open for the last 10 <laughs> laps around the top. And he, after the race was over, he's like, man, he said, I don't know what happened there on lap 10. He said, but you got so fast. He said, would you come by? That thing sound like a jet airplane. I said, I never left in the last 10 laps. <laughs> but it was good that I did it because I got to go home and, and really work on what I needed to do uh, for the next season. And then we got to, you know, what was another 90 days later, we're back to racing. Yep. And uh, next time you return to Elma, you won. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, they, well, they always say. Get right back on the bull that buck you. Or how, how's that? How's that saying? Yep. I don't think it was the same bull, but it was the same track. Well, that's I mean, uh, yeah. You know, just uh, just like Knoxville. The first time I ever came to Knoxville, we were absolutely horrible. I drove Bobby Sparks' car, and the guardrail was so tall, and it was so intimidating that we were horrible. I thought I don't even think we made the B main at Knoxville or the 360 Nationals. But anyway, he come in, he said, man, he said, would you get up on the fence? I said, I am. He said, you're 40 feet from it. I said, well, it's so tall, it looks like I'm right against it. So, you know, as a race car driver, it's just one of those deals. I wanted to conquer Knoxville. That was one place I wanted to win at. So, same way with Elma. You know, once yeah. I was hurt there, I had to go back and beat her. Yeah. You've had a lot of memorable runs at Knoxville, too. And I know, like you said earlier, it's one of your favorites uh, tracks. Uh, what's the key to getting around here? Just... Uh, you know, it's hard to explain. It used but, to be getting on the fence. Like. Yeah, you know, it's it's different lately with the way they're prepping the track and stuff. So you're actually asking me now. I have no idea. I'm not that great here right now. Uh, we're trying to work on our car to make it better for here. But, it, uh, I, I, you know, it used to be the fence, and then it went to the bottom. And right now it's kind of like, I don't know. But uh, it's Knoxville. Yeah. You did win here earlier this year, so it wasn't – you're not totally out to lunch. Yeah, but, but that – And you had a good run. I think you were the hard charger the week before the 360 national. So yeah, that that uh, all them notes that we made when we won didn't work last week. So <laughs> I'm not sure what's going to happen. I, I don't know what we're doing this. So week. it's a guessing game, and more than um, and you spent some time running here weekly too, and and uh, did well. You racked up some wins, and I think you had a string of was it six in a row that you made the final of the Knoxville Nationals. Something like that. Bill, you're supposed yeah, to know yeah, this better yeah. than me. <laughs> well, I think you made think, six nationals in a row, and I don't I, think, uh, I think many people have done that. I so. think so, yeah. Six times in a row and some pretty memorable uh, events through those years, you know, racing with Steve Kinzer for the lead there. In the Beaver, in drilling the Beaver, tool, in 12X. the Beaver, Beaver car, and uh, 
that was pretty, but if, if you wanted to go, if you wanted to ask me what my most memorable thing was at Knoxville was about two months ago when me and my daughter climbed up on the back of the cage there at Victory yeah. Lane. That was probably the coolest thing that's ever happened here. And uh, she she actually enjoyed it pretty good too. Yep, yep. And that's a good picture. That's a good picture. Um, so what what's the future hold in store for you? You, you enjoy this team right now. and, and Well, uh, you know, at first I thought uh, – you know, at the end of the year here, you know, I thought I'd, I'd been contemplating on slowing down and doing something not completely different probably, but just slowing down a little bit and not traveling so much. And, and we've talked about it for the last two or three years and me maybe slowing down, but Todd, uh, me and Todd sit down and had a meeting, uh, I don't know, a couple, two or three weeks ago and he asked me what my plans were and I told him that, uh, you know, I still wanted to race. You know, I said I'd, I was, I was, thinking maybe I didn't want to anymore, but after we figured out some problems we had and, and we're running right back up front again, I'm like, man, it's, it, I thought it was me. You know, we'd struggled for the last seven or eight months. And I thought, you know what, am I, am I just losing, losing it or whatever? But we stumbled across some problems that we had and we fixed those and we're right back to where we, where we were. And you know, and when, when the car's driving well and uh, you're making good decisions on what to do to, do to it, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, mm -hmm. So anyway, we talked about it and he asked me, you know, he said, how long do you want to race? And I said, you know, I know I can do this for a good while, you know, and uh, I guess as long as I can pay my bills and, and I'm making some money uh, to be able to keep, to, to, you know, to do it, then yeah, as long as I'm competitive, I want to do it. If I'm not competitive, you know what, I feel like that if I'm not competitive, I can help someone else to be competitive, you know, with the knowledge that I've that I've racked up in the last 30 years or so. But as long as I'm physically able to do it and can, can be competitive, that's how long I want to do it. But Todd kind of put me up in the forefront and said, what do you want to do? And I just told him, as, as long as he's a car owner, I'll drive his race car. If Todd retired next year and didn't want to be a car owner anymore, I'm done. I'll, uh, I'll never drive for another car owner. I'm, we've had a really good run. You know he's really good to me. His family's good to me. They, they, uh, you know, they love racing. They su they support me. You know we wouldn't went we didn't want to race in seven months, and he's still spending money and going to the races and all that stuff. And so I just told him I said as long as as long as you want to race, I'll race. If it ever runs to a point that he doesn't that he wants to race and I can't race, then uh, I just told him I said I'll manage the team for you and take care of the stuff and we'll hire a different driver. But Right now, it's I still see another at least probably three more years or so. Your biggest win with him, probably your career, was the fall brawl at I eighty. Would you say sixty some thousand dollars sure. in two days? Yeah, for sure. You know, we've been pretty successful. Todd helped me uh, even when it was my team. Uh, Todd's been around a long time and he's been helping me. I think since two thousand eleven, and. Uh, it's really a really weird story how we kind of got back together, but I shouldn't say back together, but I hadn't seen Todd in 20 years. You know, he, he owned Dennis Parks' car okay. uh, back in the NCRA days, and I knew him, didn't really know him well. And, and uh, when I got hurt and, and started trying to come back from that, uh, you know, I had a lot of help. Vern Ringen, you know, helped me start my own team, and we went to uh, Lucas Oil Speedway and could, had a brand new motor. It was Vern's brand new motor and could not make it run. And Todd was on business in Kansas City and, and uh, just started coming down and, and visiting. And the next thing you know, a week later, you know, we're on the phone and he's wanting to go racing and wanting to help us. And so he helped me put the rest of the pieces together for Wayne Johnson Racing and that's how it all began. And then the last, uh, this will be the second year, he has been the complete team owner. And uh, it's worked out good because you know, Todd helped a lot with Wayne Johnson racing, and I had Slip as an employee and this, that, and the other, but it was hard. Uh, you know, I'm trying to make a living, then trying to pay somebody else to help me, and it was tough. And this way, Todd's, Todd's able to have, you know, the right people in place to help me. Yep, absolutely. You've talked about promoting, too, in the future. Are you still interested in that, or have you changed your mind on that? Well, you know, I, I see all these promoters say that, they're going broke, but they keep having races. So <laughs> evidently somebody's making some money somewhere. You know what, I don't know. I, I would like to, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I think that I could help 
Uh, and maybe I can't, maybe I'd make it worse, but you know, of doing this as long as I have for 30 years or plus, uh, there's things that every racetrack I go to, I disagree with something, but I, you know, I'm not, not vocal about it anymore like I probably would 15 years ago, I'd have told them what I thought, but you know, there's some things that could be better, you know. One thing is, is track preparation. Knoxville does a good job, but a lot of places we go, um, you know, not bumping Mason City, but you know, you got these people in the in the grandstands to come see a race, and then they get to come see a freight train. So, you know, that's where racing, in my eyes, people get tired of coming to see that. So right, right. they get they 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 the interest, you know, falls off and they quit going. So that's one thing that definitely needs to be worked on is is uh, racetracks and stuff that just track prep, you know, and and I think that that'd be one thing that I could really, as a promoter, come in and maybe have a better show, knowing that we got to have two lanes of racing uh, to keep those guys up there excited. Yep. yep. Well, I want to thank you for your time. I mean, we've kept you here a while, and there's so much more to talk about, but we'll we'll do it again one of these days. So I uh, appreciate it. Next time you cater some food or something, man, make sure that we're hung I'm kind of hungry. We'll do it. We'll do it. Thanks, Bill. All right, thank you. Thanks, Bill. From micros to full-scale sprints, EMI has a complete line of chassis and components that fit any racer's needs. EMI provides a complete customer experience with personalized new chassis construction, complete suspension service, technical assistance, and repairs on any brand of chassis. More than 12,000 parts from the best brands are in stock and ready to ship. From a bare frame to a complete race-ready car, EMI can meet your needs. Call 855-525-1941 or visit us online at eaglemotorsports.com. Come